Welcome back to always, always beautiful Schellenberger Field, located just up the hill, one of the many hills in the Hill City, just off of Lakeside Drive. we got a little more Division Three field hockey action for you with a little special twist on it tonight. It is the ODAC opener for each of our two teams, a battle of small insects, if you will. Yellow Jackets and Hornets getting ready to do battle. Randolph Macon enters this one at 3-3. Three and three. Lynchburg still hanging on in the top 25. They enter this one at 25th in all the Division Three land, 4-1, and one, and coming off Boy, you talk about a heck of a dominant performance, especially on the offensive side. How about a 9-1 to win over Kenyon? That was this past weekend, the last time we saw this group of Hornets on Schellenberger Field. And let's not leave Randolph making out. They're coming off their biggest win of the season as well. Finally got those offensive wheels turning a little bit. They ripped off five points in a winning effort this past weekend on the road as well. I'm Sam Graham. Cannot wait to take you through this ODAC opener. It's a series that has been controlled mostly by Lynchburg uh, since the turn of the century, but Randolph making a proud program. It's had some great moments in its history and has gotten back to being a regular contender in the ODAC uh, conference tournament over the last several years. Looking at some of the numbers coming into today, again, goals per game, those are both buoyed by the last performances, both squads putting up season highs in terms of really every offensive category, goals, shots, shots on goal, you name it. Uh, shot percentage, two teams that are pretty efficient uh, Lynchburg you see a, a big advantage when it comes to shots and that was really the difference in that win over Kenyon this past weekend Lynchburg just got way more bites at the apple and we mentioned coming into that game when Lynchburg's able to control time of possession it's really hard to beat this team because it's just when you have the, the offense that can apply the pressure that they have and then a, a defensive line as good as it is you're just not going to get too many opportunities as an opponent two teams coming in pretty pretty comparable defenses pretty comparable when it comes to corners those corners certainly will factor as they always do we'll take a look though at some of our players to watch as we come into today's game we'll take a look first for the visitors and it's got to be the lady right there Courtney Moody not sure if she will get the start tonight or not but she has been the definition of clutch for this team, a pair of game-winning goals. She had two goals in that 5-0 to zero win over Meredith, has a game-winning goal in overtime earlier this year as well. And on the other side, Kanye Mazizi, hard to miss her flying around the field. She picked up her first career goal over Kenyon. And you may say, you know, who didn't? There was a lot of season-first goals, career-first goals in that 9-1 victory. Nine different Hornets came away with a goal. Take a look in the cage as well. On the opposite side for randolph Megan will be Valentina and Brogy. Torres, of course, her older sister, a standout player on the offensive side for Randolph Macon, now an assistant coach. Uh, Ambrosi Torres, excuse me, uh, the reigning ODAC player of the week for last week, the week of September 11th. And of course, in the cage for Lynchburg, Kayla Brady. She will make her 50th career start. She'll be looking for to add another win to her tally as well. They're running through starting lineups down on the field. We are going to take a quick break, but when we come back, as promised, we will have the start of this game between Lynchburg and Randolph-Macon. If you like being close with your professors, if you like being in small classes that help with one-on-one, -on -one, if you like being in positive communities that help you train your weak points and strengthen your strong points, then the University of Lynchburg is a great place to go. You can never go wrong with the amount of help that they offer, the amount of self-sacrifice that other people will put in for you. It has a beautiful campus, it has dedicated teachers, it has nice students, it has fun activities, and it has plenty of things to do. Day. Justin and I are officially on a break. The couple hey, canoe no, has broken up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. How are you feeling? Living the dream. Just canoeing. That's the Mexican side behind me. Um, the U.S. is that way. So far, we're all still alive. I really want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich.
As promised, we are back and just moments away from the start of this one again. The ODAC opener for this these pair of teams, Lynchburg and Randolph Macon meeting for what will be, I believe, the 60th time in each of these programs' histories. Longtime foes within the Old Dominion Athletic Conference. And, you know, we got a lot on the line tonight in this matchup. We already mentioned it's the 50th career start in the cage for Kayla Brady, but we got several other things to keep an eye on as well. Aaron Boatwright has been the surprise, if you will, on the offensive side of things for Lynchburg this year. She is one point from 50 in her career. You see up there now on the graphic, mentioned Enza Steele. Long time, year 45, seeking career win number 650. And on the other side, a little bit earlier in her career, is Jessica Wise. She is seeking her 50th career win for Randolph Macon. And then rounding things out, Kessa Schaefer, now the fifth year. She's been around a bit, and she will be making start number 75 for Lynchburg. So a little bit of history that we could see, a little bit of history that we already know we will see, of course, in the form of Brady and Schaefer. Randolph Macon on the field, wearing white as the road team. Lynchburg in their home blacks. Those have served them well over the last couple of contests. They will certainly hope, Coach Steele and company, hope that that trend continues on today. There's Coach Steele again, seeking win number 650. And to be fair, if we throw in women's lacrosse, the win she picked up at the helm of that program, getting it off and running as well. The number is well over 850 at this point, over 200 wins for the women's lacrosse program here on campus as well. But for all intents and purposes on this particular evening, it's all about field hockey. Lynchburg will be hoping for a celebration at the end of the night for their beloved head coach, accomplished head coach. And we're getting set to get things underway. Only the second weekday matchup of the season for Lynchburg. A lot of weekend games. They got a pair of them coming up in the next several days. We'll talk about that a little more later. But how about three games in four days? Don't see that a whole lot in any sport. And that includes field hockey. Lynchburg did have a span of five games in nine days last year. Three instances this year in which they will play on back-to-back -back days. They've been pretty good when that happens. They will certainly be tested, if nothing else, from a stamina perspective alongside the quality of opponent over the next several days. It is Randolph Macon that controlled the first offensive possession. Danielle Kuhn pokes it away momentarily, and Randolph Macon able to recover as the ball goes out of bounds. Lynchburg dominated time of possession against Kenyon. That's how they turned out that 9-1 lopsided result, something that, now, I mentioned in the pregame, I, I thought it would be a high-scoring affair. 9-1 to one seemed a little bit ambitious just because field hockey, you typically don't see those kinds of numbers. And Kenyon, certainly not a shabby program by any means. That's a team with a lot of talent on it, especially on the offensive end. Lynchburg just didn't give them a whole lot of chances. Trying to create one offensively early on here. Boatwright sending it down the field. Foul against Randolph Macon. Pair of teams fouling at a slightly higher clip than they would want to for Lynchburg. That number has been steadily decreasing as Mazizi, our player to watch, lines up a good looking shot that is batted to the ground by Ambrogi Torres. How about making her mark as soon as her number was called, that number 54, the neon orange top end goal for Randolph Macon. Didn't enter the year as the starter for the Yellow Jackets, but she has embraced that role, made four starts, this her fifth, and Randolph making seventh game. Her freshman campaign off to a great start. Coach Wise certainly will hope that that continues into the foreseeable future. It's a three and three record coming into this one for Randolph Macon. They have knocked off at the time, number 20 Catholic did that on the road. We know this, uh, this can be a tough place to play here as Vendrix is going to line one up. Her shot goes wide to the near side. So a quick two shots for Lynchburg. Ball goes over the end line. It's going to stay with the Hornets. It'll be reset back here at the blue line. So officials say did make contact with the Randolph-Macon stick. And it'll be Allie Freeman. Speaking of freshmen, she'll key 
in offensive possession. Take two for Lynchburg. Sends it to Kuhn. Pass gets away down the far side. She was looking for Schaefer, it looks like. 22, making that 75th career start. She tries to feed one in close to Vendrix. Vendrix scoop shot up and in. Lynchburg's gotten out to some fast starts today. Looks like that streak's gonna continue. A goal, 3-0-3 into the contest. Lynchburg goes up one to nothing quickly. It is goal number four on the year for Vendrix. She scored a career high, excuse me, a season high, four points against Kenyon this past weekend, and she continues the hot streak scoring in back-to-back -back games. It was a slow start to the year for Vendrix. Of course, she had 17 goals a year ago as a freshman to lead all scores for Lynchburg. And she's starting to find her wheels a little bit now. Four goals, and she leads the team in assists. And you got to love that as a coach. When the player that, I mean, you know, truthfully, you expect to be sort of your workhorse on the offensive side. I mean, leading returning score. Obviously, Boatwright's come up and been huge transitioning from defense to offense, and we've spent a lot of time talking about her. But Vendrix is, you know, really haven't seen her get frustrated. You know, shots weren't falling early on in the year. Stayed calm, stayed relaxed, was still able to produce in the flow of the offense. Three assists coming into today, a pair of them against Kenyon. Now she's got goal number four. Starting to challenge for that. Lead in points on the team. She's up to 11 now to Boatwright's 12. It's a bit of a question when I think we can say the legendary Jackie Lero graduated where a lot of the scoring was going to come from for this program. Especially early on last year, finding their groove, and Vendrix rose to the occasion. Now in her second season, international player from the Netherlands, big pipeline from the Netherlands, to Lynchburg, comes to field hockey. Speaking of international, right now it's Mizizzi who lines up another crafty shot. This time it's batted down once again by Ambrogi Torres. She's kind of shaking her head, getting loose. See how she responds after giving up the early goal. Mentioned she's been great, but she is a first year. You got to figure sometimes Wonder, with the lack of starts, again, this only the fifth in her career, how she'll respond to some early adversity. And as we've mentioned at length, Lynchburg's going to, they're going to put the pressure on on the offensive side of the ball. It, it's pretty unrelenting. But Randolph-Macon able to escape for right now. Good stick skills transitioning and flipping the field. Randolph-Macon going to set up its second set on the offensive end. as Elena McCoy pushing the ball across. Macon employs a few more true forwards in their starting lineup than Lynchburg does. McCoy, one of those, flexing between forward and the midfield. Lynchburg ended that last Macon possession. And a battle for it at midfield. Vendrix takes it back, tries to feed it ahead to Boatwright. Again, 23 points combined between the two of them, really making this Lynchburg offense go. But it really, I mean, you know, it, you can't leave anybody out. We mentioned in the pregame, nine different goal scorers in that nine-goal outing against Kenyon. No duplicate scores. Two players scoring their first career goals, one of those being Mazizzi, our player to watch tonight. Six players scoring their first goal of the season, and several more picking up first points in the form of assists. Team effort and team win are probably phrases that are overused, but they apply in a big way to that win this past Saturday. You talk about resume, that one, that one's gonna stick and hopefully carry a little, bo little bit of weight down the line for this Lynchburg team. Zizzy makes her defender miss, little spin move, then she hits the turf, contact applied by Isabella McNulty for Macon. Junior midfielder out of Midlothian, Virginia. Strong Richmond contingent on this 
Randolph making team. Shot from Schaefer, if we want to call it that. It didn't have a whole lot of heat on it. It's kicked away pretty easily by Ambrogi Torres. Seven players in total from the Richmond area for this Randolph-Macon squad. Including one familiar last name for Lynchburg fans. That would be Neely Weinfordner. Younger sister, two years younger in her freshman campaign of Lynchburg's Riley Weinfordner. Two of them hailing from Trinity Episcopal School. Three from Trinity Episcopal on this Randolph-Macon squad. Is, looked, I believe that shot came from outside the semicircle for Randolph-Macon. Goes out of bounds. Nobody from Lynchburg touched it, so they'll take over. After that first goal, time coming off the clock relatively quickly. We're already past the midway point of this first quarter. Lynch Lynchburg has scored yet again. It's only the Earth Sinus game that Lynchburg failed to score a first quarter goal, and now in the year, outscoring their opponents not only 7-2 in the first, but 13-2 in the first half. Still haven't let up a second quarter goal. Randolph Megan's been able to apply a little bit more pressure than we saw from Kenyon in the outset, at least speaking offensively. And Ambrogi Torres has already kicked three shots away. Kicked and batted down. Kuhn looks like she was lining up a shot. Looks like it's actually she was looking for the feed to the right side. Now Vendrick's looking for number two. She's going to try again. Block should be a defensive save. Inside, didn't catch the number there for Randolph. Making Lynchburg still trying, and Kuhn's shot is wide to the near side. So a lot of opportunities there for Lynchburg. Vendrick's getting a pair of them. We'll take a look at the possession again. That's the last shot from Kuhn that gets sent airborne just a little bit off the mark. Kuhn. Still looking for her first career goal. Missed all of her freshman season due to an ACL injury. She's one that Coach Steele's eyes will light up when you ask her about it. Just the work ethic off the charts. And I can speak to that personally. Just see her down here on the field all the time, whether it's solo or with a teammate or two, just getting some extra reps in aside from practice and in the offseason. Battle for it near midfield. Ball is going to be awarded to Randolph Macon. Good energy from the Macon sideline in the early going here. Trying to give a lift to their team on the field. That deficit still hanging at just one to nothing. If Macon can make something out of this possession. Of course, as I say, that ball nearly taken away by Boatwright. Good job by Macon to hold on to it. Lynchburg very opportunistic when it comes to taking away opponents' passes. Freeman does so just there. Right near midfield, she has stepped beautifully into her role on the defensive back line, essentially making up for Boatwright transitioning to forward. She pairs with a very formidable back line, Mallory Lamb and Riley Cameron round out the back three. You'll see, of course, right now, Olivia Muir is back there near midfield as well. Second year in the program. All Odak selection last year. She flexes between defense and the midfield. So we're getting ready to welcome in its first substitution of the day. That'll be Renee Ventil. Another product of the Netherlands. Den Bos stands at five foot nine. Her first year in the program. Had a, somewhat of a Netherlands presence a season ago, but now big presence in this year's freshman class. And again, it's not just the Netherlands. Backup goalkeeper Samira Garavi from Germany. Kanye Mazizi from Zimbabwe, where she's a member of the under-21 national team. Bringing her talents to the Hill City and she has certainly showcased them, done so so far today. A pair of shots on frame, just hadn't found the back of the cage yet. It's a nine to nothing shot advantage for Lynchburg 
now through most of this first quarter. Battle for it at midfield, taken away by Freeman, trying to push things up, set up the offense. Whistle blows, play pauses for a moment. That pass intended for Mizizzi. Don't think she was looking for it. Macon trying to flip the field, knocks it out of bounds. After all that, stays with Lynchburg. Muir will key, Muir will key it in. Cameron goes back to retrieve it in the backfield, kicks it up and ahead. Relatively easy connection as she goes to Lamb on the far side with some speed. Lamb has her momentum halted. Far side sending it back up ahead, but not before it went out of bounds. So Lynchburg again nearly turns it over. Randolph Macon makes a mistake directly after. Keep it Lynchburg ball. Bit of a trend emerging here in the first quarter there. Some missed opportunities for Randolph Macon to flip the field. Something to keep an eye on too for Lynchburg. I mean, eventually it's a sound coach team. They're probably going to start making the most of those opportunities and Something that could certainly influence the eventual outcome of this game. Getting out of trouble there and dancing around the far sideline is making thin numbers today on those white jerseys. So bear with me on that far side. Maybe a few names we miss. Lynchburg swings it back to that center back, Cameron. She's filled that role for Pretty much the entirety of her career, now a senior in the program. Do you have a couple freshmen making regular starting appearances for this Lynchburg team? But we really wouldn't say that it's a young team. Plenty of experience in every single spot on the field. Every level, if you will. That speaks to not only the talent that comes into the building for Coach Steele, but the development as well. Lynchburg turns it over via a foul with 30 seconds to go. And we might have a solid opportunity here as Mallory Lamb is unable to corral that pass. Trying to work up the field is Macon. Now Van Til gets into the action and breaks up the fast break for Randolph Macon, much to the dismay of the Randolph Macon sideline. They take it back, but again, clogging up the middle of the field. This time it's Freeman again, breaking up a couple of passes early in this game. That will take us to the end of quarter number one. So Randolph Macon applies a little bit of pressure, but it is Lynchburg that takes a 9-0 shot advantage and a 1-0 goal advantage after the first 15 minutes. We'll take a quick step aside, but when we come back, it'll be the second frame on tap. You're watching LHSN. Welcome back to Lynchburg, Virginia. Sam Graham with you on a beautiful Thursday evening. A little bit of a rare time for some field hockey action. Typically those midweek games we bring to you on Wednesday evenings, but we're not complaining. It's a beautiful fall evening. We just about made it to true fall. We make our way through September, October quickly approaching. Lynchburg with a 1-0 advantage through the first period. Keep an eye on that because in all four of Lynchburg's wins this year, they have never trailed and haven't even spent much of those games tied. And, of course, in their one loss, that being Ursinus, that code red game, they never had the lead. So certainly a good sign that they've jumped out to this early one nothing advantage, and they're doing it by playing their brand of field hockey. Really, Ursinus, the only team so far this year that's that's taken that away from Coach Steele's club. And even in that game, a lot of opportunities. Lynchburg outshot the Bears in that game, just weren't able to make the most 
of those opportunities. There a second ago, you got a chance to take a look at our head coaches in this game. It's Jessica Wise at the helm of this Randolph-Macon program. Mentioned she's looking for career win number 50. And on the other side, in year 45, of course, Coach Enza Steele looking for win number 650. Marlou Vendrix all jogging back onto the field. She's responsible for the lone score so far. Kayla Brady has not been tested yet in goal. This her 50th start. On the other side, a little bit of a different story. It's Valentina Ambrogi Torres has been tested three, excuse me, four times. She has saved three, been beaten just once. 75% save percentage is right about on par with what we've seen from her so far this season. But it is Lynchburg that's going to set up the first offensive possession of the second period. Gonna turn it back over to Randolph Macon. Again, cheers from the Randolph Macon side. This time I think it's the parents and the fans making the trip from Ashland to Lynchburg. Talk about the importance of an ODAC opener. I mean, certainly a great feeling when you see a 1 and 0 in that conference standings. We'll take a look at those some point during this game. Some surprises throughout those ODAC standings. Once the conference slate gets off and running, it, it gets off and running. Lynchburg does have some neutral site contests coming up this weekend. They're staying in the Hill City. It'll be Sweetbriar as the host, York as the opponent on Saturday. And then it'll be game on the AstroTurf of Liberty. As Lynchburg welcomes center to the Hill City. That will be on Sunday. After that, it's a game against Stevenson to round out the month and finally round out this time in the Hill City. Officially, it's a four-game homestand, two neutral sites, and then one more home game. But if we're being honest, it, it's truly a seven-game homestand for this Lynchburg team. And so far, they've done a pretty good job of making the most of it, two and one. Again, Ursinus, who's now climbed all the way up to number 19 in the national poll. Of course, the 2006 Division III national champs. Very worthy opponent. They came in here and credit to them. Got things done in a hostile environment. That was a code red game for this Lynchburg team. But Hornets have bounced back in a tremendous way. Pitching a shutout and a one nothing victory over Mary Washington. Boatwright will have to take a break on that last point as she got off her first shot of the day. Kicked out of bounds by Ambrogi Torres. So it'll stay with Lynchburg. Back to that blue line. The back of the attacking third for Lynchburg. But again, credit to Ursinus in that game. Lynchburg outshot them. Can't say they didn't get opportunities, but Ursinus made the most of theirs. But again, Lynchburg, that one nothing win over Mary Washington. Always a battle between two in-state opponents. That's not an ODAC game, but it might as well be. Just now a fellow broadcaster here on campus, Evan Gates. I mean, when you see Southern Virginia coming to town, you see Mary Washington coming to town, Christopher Newport. Those in-state non-conference battles, they, there's a little something extra to them. And even going out of the state, if it's a, a Salisbury, just those teams that you see pretty frequently playing here on Schellenberger Field, on Fox Field, on Moon Field. A little something extra in those matchups. So a big one nothing win. And then we've mentioned at length the 9-1 victory over Kenya. We talk about that homestand. Whiffing on that initial hit. And then eventually turning it over was McNulty. Now in space, this is dangerous. Lining one up and knocked them down. Might as well be bowling. Marlou Vendrix, first multi-goal game of the season. And that was a beauty. A missile in transition. She drills that one through the back of the net. Just not a whole lot that Ambrogi Torres can do on that one. Not a whole lot any goalkeeper can do about that one. Marlou Vendrix, welcome to the party. Lynchburg off and running, two nothing advantage. 11 minutes remaining in the first half. The hot start offensively has been pushed into the second quarter. It's now a seven nothing advantage for Lynchburg in the period, a 14 to two first half advantage for Lynchburg on the year. And it'd be easy for me to say, well, they outscored Kenyon 6-0 in 
in the first half just the other day, but, I mean, come on. It's 8-2 to two, even if you take that game out. Fast starts have not been a problem for this Lynchburg team. On the other side, Randolph making a little bit of, little bit of some struggles, particularly in the first quarter. While they have not, they had not allowed a goal in the first period prior to tonight. That streak's now been ended, of course. They also had not scored a goal in the first quarter. In the second quarter, it was a three to seven, now three to eight deficit. So a little bit more of a second half team is this Randolph Macon squad. But they've really, I mean, they've flipped the script on a lot of things in the outset of this season. They are 0-3 at home, but how about 3-0 and on the road? We already mentioned that win over a ranked Catholic team. They're not, they're not playing teams that aren't up to the challenge. I mean, a good non-conference slate. We talk about lining them up and knocking them down. It has not been a problem away from home through the first six games for this Randolph-Macon team. But got their backs against the wall a little bit here. We're very early in this game, just under 10 minutes remaining in this second quarter. We've played about 20. But it is a 2-0 advantage for Lynchburg. Now, Macon created some opportunities in the first quarter, couldn't turn them into shots. That's going to be the big thing to keep an eye on here in the second. But this is that danger zone that you see. Lynchburg builds up that 2-0 advantage, and then they just make it so difficult to even clear things across the midfield line. Now they're going to try to set up shot number three. That's Micah Uchis. She's into the game for the first time. She was looking for the pass, trying to hit that cross to the far side, looking for Schaefer. Schaefer collects it after the foul. A little bit of contact applied, looked like by Lynn Geiskin. Yorktown, Virginia native, a strong Virginia presence. We talked about the Richmond connection, but this is a homegrown Randolph Macon team. There's some Maryland, some New Jersey's, but strong, strong Virginia contingent up in Ashland. Let's keep an eye on this possession, especially the outset of it, and see if Lynchburg, excuse me, if Randolph Macon can get through the Lynchburg defensive pressure applied here near midfield. That foul helps. Lynchburg a little too aggressive. They're trying to force the takeaway. Mazizzi comes up to try to take one away. For the moment, she does, and yep, flips the field again. Lynchburg, that defense continues to be mighty, and it's not just the defensive back line. It's the midfielders. It's everybody. And then you look back, you look up the field, and it's like every single time as Brady makes her first save of the day, it rolls across the end line. So Randolph making best opportunity of the day so far. They're going to be credited with shot number one and be able to reset at the blue line. May have to check that last call from myself. No shots gone up on the board yet. Brady did have to come out of the cage, but they may not give her the official save. Brady making just north of four saves per game. Has recorded a save in every game. In fact, all three Lynchburg goalkeepers recorded a save in Saturday's win over Kenyon. We mentioned the scoring, but yeah, defensively everybody was active as well. First career save for Shai Schoons. It was her second appearance. And then Samira Garavi came in as well. She led the team in saves on the day. Picked up five of them. Did surrender the lone Kenyan goal, but no fault to her. Again, she did her duty stopping most of what she saw come her way. That first Kenyan goal came with just under two minutes left in regulation as Kenyon prevented Lynchburg from picking up the shutout. Hornets do have two shutouts on the year, though. They've come in two different forms. It was that one nothing win that they just ground out against Mary Washington last week, just over a week ago. And a 4-0 win over Lebanon Valley to open the year. Turnover leading to transition. It's three on two for Randolph Macon. Feeding ahead, trying to corral it before it's taken away. It was Mackenzie Wunderlich 
Randolph-Macon, excuse me, I should say Lynchburg, hasn't gotten out of trouble yet. So now Macon's try, starting to control some of the time on this clock down here on the right side. Lynchburg and Kuhn trying to work it back up and ahead. She will flip the field, but it's taken back by Macon. Back in Randolph-Macon territory. If nothing else, Yellow Jackets getting the fans involved. The sideline as well. A lot of energy to my right, that visitor side. Decent crowd collecting on the track. Helps that this was a 7 p.m. start. Get through a lot of those practices, wrap-ups, a lot of those late classes. Able to get some more people out here to take in some ODAC field hockey action. I believe that is Sydney Dumas on the far side. Women's lacrosse product here for Lynchburg. Talk about freshmen leading teams in scoring. She did just that for women's lacrosse this past year. Team, ironically, that had their season end at the hands of Randolph-Macon. Just a heck of a lacrosse game that that was. Back and forth all the way throughout. Sad somebody had to lose, and that backed up a regular season matchup between the two, which Lynchburg did come out on top. It's a lot of history between these two clubs, not just when it comes to field hockey. Every sport on campus. Of course, Randolph making men's basketball. Don't even need to say a whole lot about that group of young men. They have taken the nation in Division Three by storm as consistent, consistent rankings right near the top of the Division Three landscape. Brady forced to spring into action again, but again not challenged to make the save. There we go. Shot number one goes up for Randolph Macon. It'll come just four minutes remaining in the first half. But if nothing else, even though it did take a bit for that first shot to come up, they've kept Lynchburg from being able to continue that offensive pressure we saw in the first quarter, Hornets were on pace to come close to that 25 nothing advantage they had at the half over Kenyon. The 9 nothing advantage in the first quarter. They've only gotten up two shots, make it three in the second. Mizizzi, quick hug from Schaefer. That's her third shot and third miss of the day. It was the 12th shot of the evening for Lynchburg. Mizizzi searching for goal number two. And I'll tell you what, she's not... Going to have her confidence be shattered by any, any means. And that probably comes down to the experience she has playing field hockey at a high level. Again, playing for the Zimbabwe U21 national team. Led that squad in scoring. Had to be a good feeling. Talked to her post game after that Kenyan game. Just getting the lid off and finding that first career goal in collegiate lacrosse. Excuse me, collegiate field hockey. I have no doubt that number two will come at some point, but it is number two with the ball right now. It's Danielle Kuhn. That one nearly turned over, then will be turned over, Macon trying to get out of this back half, trying to continue to put the pressure with their offense. They've done a good job of that here in this second quarter. I know Lynchburg pushed the lead out to two to nothing. But again, we'll go back to that goal by Marlou Vendrix. I'm sure we'll show it two or three more times before this game is over, but... For, for a freshman goalkeeper making just her fifth career start, it, it really doesn't matter if it's career start number five or career start number 50. There's just you're coming in transition, that kind of speed, stick skills that Vendrix has, the eye for the goal that she's established, that her 21st, excuse me, 22nd career score. Not a lot of options when it comes to knocking that thing down. We mentioned the battle between Boatwright and Vendrix earlier after her first score of the day. Vendrix is now taking control, 13 points on the year with that last goal. So 25 now between she and Boatwright. Battle for it near midfield. We got about 90 seconds remaining in this first half. Schaefer has it and some numbers for Lynchburg. She's got options in the pass game. Good on-ball defense applied to stop the transition attack there by Randolph-Macon. Foul is going to be awarded inside the circle. Yeah, we're going to get penalty corner number one. Man, seven 
combined 14 was the average between these two clubs coming into tonight's contest. It took just about a full 30 minutes before we saw our first set piece. And this is a big moment in the course of this game. Maybe for Randolph Macon more than Lynchburg. Hornets have done a great job, especially as the season has progressed, converting these opportunities into scores. Boatwright has keyed most of them in, and she'll do so right here. See if Macon can get out of trouble here late in the first half. They go into Cameron. She feeds it far side to Schaefer. Schaefer lines up a shot, stopped initially, stopped again by Ambrogi Torres. It's not over yet. Bounces back out to Schaefer, and now the official says, yeah. Randolph Macon gets the win in that game within the game. They avoid giving up goal number three. That's a moment where you give a little fist pump on the sideline to Coach Weiss and company. Now just 35 seconds to go. Don't count Lynchburg out, though. Micah Ucha scoring with no time left on the clock to end the first half the other day. Doesn't look like that's going to be the story on that end of the field here tonight, though. 20 seconds to go. Clock continues to roll. Foul called far side. Will not stop the clock. Does keep the ball with Randolph Macon. They'll try to set this thing up quickly at the blue line. Here we go with seven. Macon looking for its first goal. That one, they would have had a decent look at it right in the center of the field had it been corralled, but corralled it was not by Lana Thatch. It rolls out of bounds, and that will do it for the first half. Randolph Macon just about got its best look at the goal to try and beat the buzzer and pick up their first score of the afternoon, but instead it's Lynchburg defense continuing to hold serve. It is a 2-0 Lynchburg advantage. Both scores at the hands of Marlou Vendricks, and we have hit the half in Lynchburg. We're going to step aside for just a moment, but when we come back, we'll have stats, highlights, and more at the break. The biggest thing that I've taken from Westover is probably my interactions with faculty. I started working with Dr. Fryer. He's always available for help and he makes sure that I get to do the experiments and not just be there while he does them. I didn't want to limit myself when I came here to just taking the prereqs for med school. I wanted to get a full, well-rounded education and I definitely found that in the Westover program. It's given me the opportunity to keep playing soccer at a competitive level, uh, but also it's given me the ability to be a student and to pursue other activities such as EMS. hundred percent do Westover because it's not something they're going to regret, and it's going to be a lot of work, but so is everything else. It's just going to help build their education that they've already had and make them a better person for it. in the dream. USA, Mexico. That was so exciting. If you like being close with your professors, if you like being in small classes that help with one-on-one, -on -one, if you like being in positive communities that help you train your weak points and strengthen your strong points, then the University of Lynchburg is a great place to go. You can never go wrong with the amount of help that they offer, the amount of self-sacrifice that other people will put in for you. It has a beautiful campus, it has dedicated teachers, it has nice students, it has fun activities, and it has plenty of things to do.
rough day. Jess and I are officially on a break. The couple hey, canoe no, has broken up. <laughs> it's not. How you feeling? Living the dream. Just canoeing. That's the Mexican side behind me. Um, the U.S. is that way. So far, we're all still alive. I really want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We've hit the half in Lynchburg, Virginia. We got a pair of scores. We'll get a chance to take a look at both of them here in this halftime highlight special. Shout out to Laura on replay. First one by Marlou Vendrix, and she did it again later. A pair of really nice goals by the sophomore forward for Lynchburg. Here is that second one. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say this was one of, if not the best goal we've seen on Schillenberger Field so far this season. I won't comment about the soccer teams. Haven't seen all of those goals so far. But speaking about field hockey, I'm going to go ahead and give it to Marlou Vendrick. She is the difference in this game. That and the 12-1 shot disparity that Lynchburg holds presently. But we'll take a look at the numbers as we have hit the half. Of course, we know the goals. It's 2 to nothing Lynchburg at the moment. And that 12-1 shot advantage is accompanied by a 7-0 shot on goal advantage. And we showed those two goals that, that Vendrix has scored. We mentioned her in the pregame. That is not to take absolutely anything away from Valentina Ambrogi Torres. She has still put together a very good game so far in goal. You see those five saves on seven shots faced. Not shabby at all. The biggest thing is can her offense get something going? They started to generate a little bit more, minute, more momentum through that second quarter. Obviously did not pick up a goal, but did take the lid off when it comes to shots. And again, you know, the penalty quarter is going to be big for, for both sides. That's a great way for Randolph Macon to inject some instant offense in the second half of this game. But for Lynchburg as well, they, they only had one. Both teams averaging uh, north of seven on the year. And for Lynchburg in particular, they do a great job of utilizing those set pieces and turning some points off of them. Uh, finally, the foul's a little bit high, but that's pretty much what we've come to expect for both of these two teams. Not a big point of concern. Uh, Coach Steele's mentioned that ad nauseum. You know, when you have a team as athletic as she does, same goes for Randolph Macon. You're going to have some fouls. You're going to have some infractions. You do want to limit them as much as possible, but to a certain degree, kind of hard to avoid. We got about two minutes until the second half gets underway. We'll give you a quick break, get something to drink, do what you need to do, but do not miss the second half of action here 
on LHSN. I am a first generation college student. I applied to 16 universities and uh, I actually had uh, decided on going to a different university. But, you know, doing, you know, crafts and everything on my own and, and the, you know, the need for uh, a good credit with the Parent PLUS loan and everything like that. My plans kind of fell through. I just couldn't give up hope. Uh, and so I'm going through, just rustling through this, like, shoebox I have full of, like, <laughs> acceptance letters and financial aid letters. And um, I got my financial aid reward letter and I also received scholarships from the school and it was, you know, the most affordable for me. They were excited to work with me. I financial aid. Just a quick break there. Hope you still had time to get yourself set and ready for this second half Lynchburg. On pace to pull off win number 650 in the career, the storied career of head coach Enza Steele. They've made it through two quarters. They are unblemished when it comes to goals against, and Marlou Vendricks has given them two goals up on their opponents tonight. Randolph Macon. Again, some momentum generated near that end of that second quarter by Randolph Macon. They started to take the ball away from Lynchburg a little bit more, and that so often is the key to getting the best of this Lynchburg team, but they're going to have to get more shots up. They're going to have to generate those in whatever form that that may take, whether it is set pieces you know, in the form of penalty corners, whether it's getting out in transition. At times, Lynchburg's transition defense has had a little bit of trouble. Overall, still a, a great unit, as every unit really is for this Lynchburg team, a very sound group. As you take a look at Coach Steele there, Rest assured, any adjustments that need to be made on the Lynchburg side of things, they have been made. But how does Randolph make and counter adjust in this second half? It will be Lynchburg this time starting with the ball right at midfield. Perks of being the host. They go backwards to go forward. It's Schaefer, but her pass quickly will be nearly intercepted. Now it will be intercepted. Initially poked away by Anna Stribling. She's on that NFHCA All-American Award watch list. Several Hornets on that as well. A pair of Yellow Jackets made the list. She pairs. It's Lunchburg again that takes over offensively. Center of the Field, Riley Cameron lifts one in there. How about the leaping deflection by Ambrogi Torres in goal? That's save number six, and she continues to stand in there and make plays in the cage. A little bit fired up about that one, as she should be. That was a great stop. We'll take a look at it again. Cameron shooting that one in there into the circle with some speed, and you're thinking, all right, I think Vendrix might be picking up the hat trick here. She normally goes right over the outstretched hand of the goalkeeper, but uh-uh-uh, not so fast. And Brogy Torres bats that one right back down to the carpet. But Lynchburg going to try again on this offensive possession. Tiptoeing near that back line was Mizizzi. Has it taken away, almost kept in bounds. Good chop there on the near side. Lynchburg keeps it. Lamb sends it in, looking for Mizizzi. Now Mazizzi has it, spins, what a pass. Not quite ready for it was Vendrix. Had she been, would have had a good look at goal number three. This is the most active we have seen her early on in this season. This game six for Lynchburg. Four and one record coming in, looking to push the win streak out to three before going on the road to face what by the numbers will be their toughest test of the season. York currently ranked inside the top ten at number seven. Center's a team that gave Lynchburg a little bit of trouble a season ago as well. 
Be a good measuring stick game on Sunday at Liberty. Don't overlook the team from Kentucky by any means. But Lynchburg in those back-to-back -back opportunities, they've been good. They got three of them this year. They had two of them a season ago. The first one of the season they've already gotten through. They were perfect, 2-0 and over, over Lebanon Valley and Dickinson. That opened the season up with a bang. But overall, their last three instances playing on back-to-back -back days, they are 5-1 and one overall. They won all three of the second halves of those doubleheaders. And they have swept two. Lynchburg does not have a matchup against a fellow ranked opponent yet this season. Ursinus, though they are 19th now, was not ranked when the two teams met. Yes, me a little bit surprising. That was a very, very good Ursinus team that, and a program that's good pretty much year in and year out. One that stands up neck and neck with this Lynchburg program. Again, that 2006 national championship as well. But at the moment, the goal is a 1-0 start in ODAC play. Open up the conference season with a leg up. And we'll get you those ODAC standings here momentarily. But a bit of a surprise within the league so far. Randolph-Macon was picked fifth in the preseason poll. Lynchburg first, but it was tight at the top. Lynchburg was the runners-up last year. They fell to Washington and Lee on the road in the ODAC title game. Talk about a hard-fought game. That was a... One nothing decision in favor of the Generals. And it took until overtime to find that decision. 0-0 zero, zero after regulation. Don't see that every day. Washington Lee was picked second in the preseason, just one point behind Lynchburg and Shenandoah, who Lynchburg beat in last year's semifinals. They were picked third, just one point behind Washington and Lee. So a total of two points separating first and third in the conference. As Vendrix has it here with really nobody in front of her momentarily. Now she puts on the brakes, going to try a scoop shot, and it is sent too far to the right. Out of bounds near side. Stays on the right side of the field. Allie Freeman sends it back in from the back line of this attacking third. She goes near side to Lamb. It mishandles it. Goes out of bounds. She'll take a few steps back. Not too many, though, because I guarantee you there's going to be some pressure being applied now as Lynchburg tries to stop Randolph-Macon from getting out of their defending third. Macon can tell, looking for some more of those sure passes, not afraid to send the ball backwards before going forwards at times. Problem is, is even when you make sound passes, these Lynchburg defenders do a great job of making you second guess them. Seemed to always be at the right place at the right time. That time it was Kuhn that poked it away. Now hitting the turf far side. Looks like Vendrix. Could be a troublesome sign for Coach Steele's club. She is slow to get up but does get up. Seems to be okay. Just one of those shake it off moments it looks like. Conversation between officials right now. Let's see if we get a card. We haven't had one so far in the game. Clean game so far. No yellow or red cards on the year for Lynchburg. Doesn't look like we get a card here, but we will get a penalty corner. It'll be number two on the day for Lynchburg. So it took them a bit to generate their first set piece of the day. Not quite as long into the second half to find their second. But right again, we'll send it in. There's Cameron in the middle of it all. Almost looking like a, a football formation here. We got Kanye Mazizi split out wide. Vendrix on the other side. Those are probably who you're looking to from a scoring perspective. But again, it does go into Cameron to try and survey. She mishandles it, though. Rolls back across an opportunistic. This time is Randolph Macon. They're going to try to get out in transition. So, boy, that took a turn. Isabella McNulty with it right now. Battles for it with Kuhn. Takes it back. And off Macon, standing tall, not just getting out of trouble, but legitimately winning these penalty corner opportunities, though there have been few, only two so far, but Lynchburg not 
even getting off a shot here on this second opportunity. Sending it out of bounds near the Lynchburg goal. I believe was Muir, and that's going to draw a penalty corner for Randolph Macon. So we thought we might see a few more of these in the second half, and it is always nice when occasionally the blind squirrel finds a nut. And in this case, I was right. We've seen two through the first round six and a half minutes of this second half. So first one of the day for Randolph Macon will be sent in by Mackenzie Wunderlich. Hattrick on the year against Goucher. And they're going to get goal number one. The set pieces have come into play in a big way. Randolph Macon gets on the board, cuts the deficit in half. And it is now a 2-1 game as another opponent will avoid the shutout at the hands of Lynchburg. First time Kayla Brady has truly been tested today, and they get the best of her. Wait to get you the score on that goal. For now, we'll just call it a Randolph Macon team score. But we will get you that goal score as soon as we have it. Now, Cameron again mishandles the ball. Almost trouble again for Lynchburg. As now it's Randolph making the opportunistic team. So how about signs of life from Jessica Weiss's club? The road team, we mentioned they are pretty comfortable playing away from home. 3-0 so far. And they got something to say here at the midpoint of this third frame. Lynchburg does eventually get out of trouble. Approaching the midway point of the third. Hornets two shots to one Randolph Macon attempt in this third quarter. But Macon's first shot on goal results in a score. Again, Brady drawn out of the goal there. Kind of similar to Vendrix's goal earlier. When you can get that goalie to step up, suddenly the physics of it all become a little bit harder to stop. You allow the goalie to get set inside the smaller semicircle and try to make something happen where they're familiar, where they're comfortable. That's a whole different story than taking a step into one, getting a good clean swing of the stick and just sneaking one by them. That's what happened on each of our last two goals. We have gotten those that goal score. It was an assisted score, very high percentage of goals for Randolph making this year have been assisted. This time, the helper was Anna Stribling, and she sent it to our player to watch, Courtney Moody, coming off a career high two goals last time out against Meredith. Again, a 5 nothing win there. As Randolph Macon found the offensive acumen in that one, just as Lynchburg did against Kenyon. But Hornets going to try to answer with 6.49 to go in the third. Aaron Boatwright sending in penalty corner number three of the day for Lynchburg, our fourth between the two teams combined. Vendrix might have been looking to get a little bit more heat on that shot. It is blocked by the Randolph making defense before it reaches Ambrogi Torres. And speaking of Ambrogi Torres in goal, got to be a little bit of a sigh of relief seeing that first goal go up on the board. Kind of gives you encouragement to what she's been doing in the cage. Going back to that point on Moody is another shot lined up far side. Looked like they believe that that was Kuhn. Well, no, it looks like two numbers. Try to get a closer look there. Maybe Brooke Highland. Kuhn has it now. Scoots it across the carpet near side to Van Teel back into the game. Van Teel's cross is kicked away again by Ambrogi Torres. Shot 17 denied by save number six for Randolph Macon. But another foul inside the semicircle is going to generate yet another penalty corner for Lynchburg. See what the formation looks like this time for Coach Steele. The most important, it's going to be business as usual. Boatwright's going to send it in. Cameron's going to set up 
in the middle of the formation. Again, receivers split wide. It's two to the right, one to the left. It's Mizizi and looks like 26 on the far right, almost hiding down there. Cameron corrals it this time, but has nowhere to go with it. Great on-ball defense again from Randolph-Macon. It's forced out the back end line. See who they say. Said it went off of Randolph-Macon. Lynchburg resets at the blue line. But again, Macon standing tall against the Lynchburg penalty opportunities. Hornets have gotten some cracks at those set pieces here in the third quarter, but Big Piece is taking advantage of them. You can get as many penalty corners as you want, but if you can't turn them into, into goals, then at the end of the day, they're relatively worthless. On the flip side, seen just one corner for Randolph Macon, but turned into a goal. Bit of that Ursinus story again as Schaefer battles for the ball near side. Mitchie has it taken away and then commits a foul, so it will be turned back over credit to Isabella McNulty forcing the turnover there. Ball's fed ahead by the lone goal scorer for Randolph Macon, Courtney Moody. That last goal was her fourth on the year. She leads the team. Two goals versus Meredith. Also had the overtime game winning score against Hood. So responsible for two of the three game winning goals on the year for Macon. Now we'll get a penalty against Allie Freeman. She's going to have to take a break over by the scorer's table. She will be released at 2-11. So a two-minute penalty for Allie Freeman. And a bit of an opportunity now for Randolph Macon if they can flip the field. They're going to have a player up opportunity, 11 to 10. Mizizzi has it right now. They're going to try. Lynchburg going to try as hard as they can not to allow Randolph Macon to take advantage. How about a sliding, sweeping save by Ambrogi Torres? We've seen just about everything be pulled out of her bag of tricks tonight to keep Lynchburg stuck at two goals. Marlou Vendrix had the magic touch, but nobody else been able to get past Ambrogi Torres. Macon looking ahead. They do feed it ahead. It's Annie Pruitt crossing midfield. Defense given by Renee Van Teel. And again, Macon will look to go backwards. Again, nothing wrong with that. It's gotten them out of a couple tough situations as they try to avoid turnovers. Mizizzi this time eventually does take it away for Lynchburg. Right at 30 seconds left on the penalty for Freeman, and Lynchburg has it in their attacking third yet again. So good job by the Lynchburg crew at trying to keep Macon from being able to exploit the green card opportunity. Van Teel has it near side. She puts on the brakes. Defender soars by her. Now Van Teel might try to line up a shot. She can't. Foul is called, but it's going to go... Yep, going to go against Randolph Macon. For a second, it looked like the Lynchburg, the entire Lynchburg team was jogging back to the backfield. But no, Van Teel draws the foul. And again, we will get a penalty corner for Lynchburg. Should be number five on the evening. So far, the corners have not resulted in a whole lot for Lynchburg. Credit to the Randolph Macon defense. At times, keeping Lynchburg from even getting a shot off. Boatwright does not go to Cameron this time. She goes far side to Vendrix. Vendrix a spin, a shot blocked by the randolph making defender. Trying to collect the rebound is Schaefer. She will not even get a shot off. Correction there. It looks like it's Jenna Tangiers, not Schaefer, that took that shot. Lynchburg does draw another penalty corner out of the ordeal, and to much of Allie Freeman's dismay, it means she has to wait on the sidelines a little bit longer. One second left in that penalty because, of course, clock stops for the corners. This time they do go to Cameron. She goes ahead, lines up a shot 
of her own. Boatwright tried to collect the rebound but could not. Sends it across the end line. And now it is Randolph Macon that again escapes the Lynchburg corners. Now six that Lynchburg has forced nearing that season average of seven. Just haven't been able to do anything with it. Mentioned the Earth Sinus game earlier. That's kind of what it feels like right now. It's 19 to two in the shots department. But Randolph Macon, if you think they're not in this game, you've been watching a different game. They, they are right in this thing. It is two to one. We're setting up for what should be a pretty interesting and monumental fourth quarter. Again, there's a little bit on the line here tonight. Both coaches looking for big wins. And perhaps as they would each say, more importantly, they're looking to get out to a 1-0 start in conference play. It's not a massive conference season. It's a nine-game slate, so every game matters a whole lot, especially when it comes to tiebreakers. And you're talking about two teams picked in the top five of the conference that hold non-conference records both in the top three. Tangiers trying to collect that ball, slips to the turf and cannot corral it. Randolph making again with its back against the wall, getting out of trouble. Credit to the making defense today. Of course, they got beat in transition on the second of Marlu Vendrix's two goals. But overall, a great effort that has been anchored by Ambrogi Torres to keep the Yellow Jackets in this game on the road. It's been a good bit since Macon has won in this series. They're going to have a chance to try and turn the tide in the fourth, and at the end of the day, that's all you can ask for. Both teams kind of just waiting, letting that thing play out after the ball rolls out of bounds. And we have hit the end of the third quarter. We have a new score to bring you. It's 2-1. to one. Lynchburg continues to lead. They have not trailed. But Randolph-Macon applying a little bit of extra pressure in the third period. We will step aside one more time before bringing you the fourth quarter in its entirety on LHSN. One quarter to go in this one, a 2-1 Lynchburg lead through 45 minutes for a moment. We were sort of on that precipice. Was Lynchburg going to run away with it, or was Randolph Macon going to rise to the occasion on the road? And the latter is what we've seen so far. I'd say Lynchburg still has controlled time of possession for the most part, and that's sort of the game plan. They lead shots at 20-2, but the Yellow Jackets have something to say about Coach Enza Steele reaching that 650th career win. That's what's on the line as we enter the fourth quarter here on LHSN. Sam Graham with you for what's been an entertaining game so far. Malu Vendrix, the two scores for Lynchburg and one goal on the board for Randolph Macon scored by Courtney Moody, assist to Anna Stribling. Take a look at the ODAC standings at this point in the year. Lynchburg and Shenandoah out in front by a good bit, but again, a win today for Randolph Macon shoots them to the top of the standings and shakes all this up a little bit. Still missing from our table here of the top eight is Washington and Lee, a two and four start for the Generals. Certainly not what they had in mind. It's a, it's a long season, right around 20 games. So there is time for the Generals to recover, but they've fallen out of the top 25. Lynchburg is 25th, Shenandoah is 22nd. 
That is it for the top 25 representation from the Old Dominion Athletic Conference. And of scheduling notes, Lynchburg does have to travel to both Shenandoah and Washington and Lee this year. Will not have the friendly confines of Schellenberger Field to lean back on in those two big time ODAC contests. Both goalkeepers remain the same as we enter the fourth quarter. Ambrogi Torres having a heck of a day in her fifth career start. Kayla Brady has been tested once and beaten once. Kind of rare that that happens. Now in her 50th career start. Lynchburg has a habit of goalkeepers extending their stays, taking the reins early in their careers and making the most of their opportunities. And Brady, the latest in that long line. It'll be a battle for the starting spot when she leaves after this year. Shai Schoons and Samira Garavi have both gotten some limited playing time. It's so recently as last weekend. I'm sure whichever one winds up being the starter next season will once again rise to the occasion. Right now, we got a long way to go in the 2023 campaign, and it's all about Kayla Brady in cage for the Hornets. Again, spending... Most of our time looking to the right of the press box here on Schellenberger Field, looking at Lynchburg, try to set something up offensively and continue just time after time. While Randolph making has committed some errors. You saw one just there, turning it over out of bounds. They've been formidable. Brick wall of sorts, keeping things clean for the most part, limiting Lynchburg to those two first half goals. Good use of the stick on the near side getting away from that out-of-bounds line and an opponent was Lisanne van der Weich. She recorded her first career goal against Kenyon as well, joining Kanye Mazizi. It's a pair of international players getting on the board for the first time in their young careers. Both of them first-year athletes in the program. Tiptoeing on the far line, Lynchburg trying to keep it on this side. And we might have an opportunity in transition, giving chase on the far side. Looks like Micah Uchis. She doesn't quite get there in time, but eventually the Lynchburg defense does corral it. Knock it back into the front field where it is taken back by Macon. Vendrix battling for it. Two goals in the first half, Ben Relatively quiet in the second. She does have a shot. Came in the third quarter. Now with 11 and a half minutes to go. See if Lynchburg continues to lean on Hirsch. I mean, she has been the hot hand. Two unassisted goals to put Lynchburg ahead. It's boat right. You expect to be a factor late in the game. Mazizzi's gotten a number of shot attempts. Schaefer always got to keep an eye on her. Hadn't found that first goal of the season, but it's coming. Right now it's Mazizzi battling for it. Most of the time she wins those. This time she does as well. Does it by way of a foul, so not the traditional spin move or crossover, if you will, but does give Lynchburg possession nonetheless. This time she mishandles the pass from Vinterweich. That ball scoots away from everybody. Eventually taken back by Lynchburg. Cameron sends it ahead. Looking for Mazizzi. Foul against Macon. Sent back ahead. Looks like Riley Weinfordner into the game. Sydney Rowe into the game for Lynchburg now as well. Only one appearance in the first four games, but then was active against Kenyon, and again, now making appearance number three. She was a big-time factor of freshman campaign on the offensive side of the ball for Lynchburg. We'll certainly look to get her involved as the season rolls on now 
as well. Ball goes out of bounds, knocked there by Randolph Macon. Ventil tries to send it back in. It is blocked by number 13 for Macon. Annie Pruitt, freshman out of West Pen Westminster, Maryland, called her name a few times this evening. Battle for it on the far side, taken away by Randolph Macon, battling on the sideline, sent back to the Lynchburg. Big time swing of the stick there. It's blocked momentarily, collected by Schaefer. She'll look for some help in close. Trying to help was Vanderweich. Instead, it's going to result in another penalty corner for Lynchburg. So go ahead and check the box of Lynchburg setting up these set pieces, setting up these penalty corners. The box is still empty when it comes to converting them into points, but that probably has more to do with the effort of the Randolph-Macon defense than it does of the plays that are being run by Lynchburg. Sydney Rowe, Mazizzi to the near side, Micah Uchis on the outside. They go to Uchis. She lined one up, it is blocked. And a foul goes against Macon. So once again, we will have back-to-back -back penalty corners. But Macon continues to keep a goose egg on the side of Lynchburg and turning these things into points. Riley Weinfordner is going to key this one in. Boatwright a spell on the bench. Looks like Weinfordner is going to do it this time for the first time tonight from the near side. Last time, to my memory, that Juan Fortner sent in a penalty corner. She wound up tapping it in from right next to the post. This time, Cameron tries to get the shot off. It's again blocked, and I believe it was again blocked by number 13 in white, Annie Pruitt. So we're rising to the occasion here tonight on the road. Quite a few blocks credited to her on the evening. Picks up one there, but again... Macon unable to get out of their own way. They force another penalty corner. And again, Lynchburg will set things up. Weinfordner again will send it in. Van Teel is closest by. Everybody up front, except for Muir and, of course, Caleb Brady. Cameron is far back, so insurance there is the senior. Van Teel's shot is blocked. Lynchburg trying to collect the rebound. Mazizzi had it originally, and now Macon gets away from it. It's two on two in transition. That pass a little bit ahead. Some anger from the Randolph-Macon sideline. And Coach Wise... Yellow Jackets forced to reset far back into their own defending third. That pass is sent far into the Lynchburg sky. I believe it was Anna Shire. A pair of defensive saves for her last game out. Also a member of last year's NFF, NFHCA National Academic Team, seven Yellow Jackets. Honored on that squad. That play ultimately sends the ball deep into Lynchburg territory, that where it will stay. Sent back in on the near side. First backward, now a big swing, send the ball forward. Goes out of bounds, looks like last touched by Lynchburg. The Hornets now forced to play defense. Randolph Macon looking for the equalizer. Six and a half minutes to play. Cameron pokes that ball away, trying to get out of harm's way. Send this thing up ahead. It is going to roll out of bounds before Sidney Rowe could track it down, trying to force the transition opportunity. At best, it would have been a two-on-two -two 
look for Lynchburg with nobody out ahead of the Macon defense. Macon trying to flip the field, sends it right back out of bounds on the left side. So Macon unable to find the equalizer now on the flip side. Lynchburg trying still to find the knockout punch, poking that ball away in transition, off and running. One of the fastest players on the team turning and firing was Mizizzi, but once again, her shot was blocked, knocked away and out of harm's way by Ambrogi Torres. She has risen to the occasion tonight, save number eight for the first year in the cage. Eight saves for Macon to none for Kayla Brady and Lynchburg. The save percentage now up to 80%. That is above the season average for Ambrogi Torres. So putting together a master class in goal. Schaefer trying to beat her there for Lynchburg. And then just too many Yellow Jackets in the area. Lynchburg wasn't able to come up with a second opportunity. Knocked away and forces Lynchburg to really reset all the way back near midfield as Cameron tries to send it back ahead. And you notice just with how Lynchburg set up, there's a lot more bodies focused in that attacking third, trying to plant that pressure offensively, but it's allowed Macon to try and get out in transition a couple times tonight, because if that ball finds its way past somebody, especially past Riley Cameron, there's just not a whole lot back to defend except for Kayla Brady. Now you're starting to see some of those other defenders sent back a little deeper. It's a little bit of a prevent defense while trying not to get too conservative offensively either. Talk about adjustments from Coach Steele. Trying to get all of that one, Mazzizzi instead. Dangerous stick called, turned back over on the foul to Randolph Macon. Just over four minutes to go, and our score has not changed. We've had a score in each quarter, one goal apiece. First two quarters went Lynchburg's way, the third to Randolph Macon. Collecting that one quickly and running is Elena McCoy. She feeds it ahead, far side battle. The speed goes to Randolph Macon on that one, coming up last minute, but overplaying it was Van Teel. And a penalty corner awarded to Randolph Macon. That could have been disastrous in the moment though. Van Teel was the last line of defense not named Kayla Brady. And she just overshot the offensive player in that situation. It happens. Secondary defense, I believe, was applied by Kessa Schaefer. So great recognition and awareness by her to stop a shot from being sent off. But hit with the foul in the process. It's penalty corner number two for Randolph Macon. Last time they turned it into a goal, trying to do it again. They go to the near side, broken up. Who else? Kanye Mazizzi. Big play defensively for Lynchburg. Battle on the near side. Mazizzi's shot knocked out of bounds. I, they're going to say it was blocked by Randolph Macon. I'll go along with that call. Looks like Mazizzi might have sent it out on her own. But it will be Lynchburg ball. Ventil works back to Cameron. Lynchburg trying to get out. It's back being against the wall. Hadn't happened a lot tonight, but Macon's made it happen a little more in this second half. Still a 26 to two shot advantage for Lynchburg, if you can believe that. 11 shots placed on frame for Lynchburg tonight. Only the one came in the third quarter for Randolph Macon, but this is a one score game. Lynchburg trying to change that right now offensively. And Adorstein. And on the near side, dribbling around a pair of Randolph Macon defenders. Third defender comes up, gives proper defense on the near side, but called for the foul. And it is going to be another penalty corner for Lynchburg. The tide has certainly shifted when it comes to generating these set pieces, really for both sides, but especially for Lynchburg in this second half. They're now up over their season average when it comes to corners. And the thing you have to watch out for with Lynchburg, of course, the possession's not over until the defense can, you know, by the official's recognition, get the ball out of their defending third, out of the circle and, you know, truly somewhat possess it. But Lynchburg has a tendency to stack 
These penalty corners, one on top of the other one. That one, not much drama along with it. Schaefer's shot is slightly wide and off the mark near side. So one shot and done. But coming in quickly is Doristine. I don't think Macon saw her trying to feed that pass ahead. Clock stops again as another penalty corner generated by the Hornets. And we'll give all the credit on that one to Anna Doristine. She picks off the pass as Randolph Macon was trying to get away from its defending third. Kind of came out of nowhere. Moving left to right, she breaks that one up. And she's in the center of this set piece. Mazizzi far out wide. They go to the far side, looks like to Danielle Kuhn. She mishandles it, able to go back and grab it. Can she get a shot off? She does, but not the one she would like. Not much steam on that one. And again, Randolph Macon, time and time again, now with under two minutes to go. They continue to rise to the occasion. The defense has kept them in this game. Can the offense draw them even? Mazizzi again forces the turnover. Works it to Schaefer. Collected by Macon. And then sent out of bounds. So Lynchburg ball in their attacking third. Stepping up and into it is Juan Fordner to collect it. Trying to be opportunistic here. She feeds inside. That is, looks like Van, Van Tila momentarily it is not. It's Anna Dorstein with it right now. 109 to go. Lynchburg, if nothing else, wasting a lot of time keeping the ball on this side of the field, and that is just about as good as a goal at this point in the game. I'd wager to say if Lynchburg finds a third goal, that might be too much to overcome for Randolph-Macon, but right now time is just slowly ticking away, and Macon cannot take the ball away from Lynchburg. Mazizzi controlling it in the center of the field. And now will be a foul and a turnover to Randolph-Macon, but they don't have much time to work with. 35 seconds, trailing by one score. Flinchburg can pick up another defensive stop. That might be all it takes, and they got one. Turned it over, wasting more time, down to 23 seconds. Another foul going against Lynchburg. Coach Steele probably okay with that because it doesn't really allow Randolph-Macon to advance the ball very far. With 14 seconds, Van Teel collects. It's back in the attacking third. And as we go under 10 seconds to play, Lynchburg going to hold on and pick up win number one in conference play. It is going to improve to 5-1 and one overall. A little more drama than we thought when we hit the half as it's a 2-1 to one final. Lynchburg does not find a score in the second half. But Coach Enza Steele picks up career win number six. 150, 650, one of the winningest coaches ever to do it in Division Three. She is Lynchburg Field Hockey, and she will be honored post-game for what is truly an unbelievable, incredible accomplishment. And it doesn't even begin to tell the full story of what she has meant to Lynchburg Field Hockey in her 45-year tenure. That does it for this game. Again, a little bit more drama than we thought we would get when we hit the half. It was a 2-0 advantage. Marlou Vendricks, a pair of goals. But the 21-time ODAC champion, 13-time ODAC coach of the year is the prevailing story in tonight's contest. She picks up yet another milestone victory. It's 650 in field hockey. It's over 850 overall. Legend doesn't begin to describe it, and we will leave you with that image. Head coach Enza Steele picks up career win number 650. Lynchburg moves to 5-1, jumps to the top of the ODAC standings at 1-0 in conference play, and they will take a three-game win streak on the road, sort of, when they go across town to Sweetbriar for a neutral site battle with number 7 York. We will have that for you on LHSN 11 a.m. on Saturday. But... Until then, be happy, be whole. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.